So here's my opening slide that I was talking to. And uh, I need to provide a little bit of background first because I'm not sure uh, how familiar the audience is with MSC walls. So MSC walls are mechanically stabilized earth walls. They're constructed with uh, inextensible steel reinforcement or relatively uh, extensible polymeric reinforcement materials. And it's, and it's fair to say that at this point in time, uh, you know, it's a mature and, and proven technology, but it's always entertaining and interesting to reflect back on uh, when this technology began. And one of the first steel reinforced walls uh, was a wall that was constructed with steel strips that you can see here in this photograph and a, and a concrete facing. So the purpose of the steel strips was to add strength and stiffness to the soil behind the concrete panels and to provide support to the concrete panels. Since you know, those early days, I mean, that photo was taken in 1971, this technology uh, has become ubiquitous in the civil engineering field. And here is a, a picture of uh, a 46 meter high uh, steel strip reinforced soil wall. And you can see And side the technology is still the same with these steel strips, uh, improving the behavior of this. However, in addition to simply inextensible steel uh, welded wire and the like, but the the purpose and, uh, of these reinforcement elements remains the same, regardless of the the type and shape of the steel reinforcement. Other types of reinforcement include geosynthetics. So these are high performance polymeric materials. Uh, they can come in the form of sheets, for example, a woven polyester geotextile is shown here or a geogrid material with open apertures that are better able to engage with the soil. They're more flexible but they still perform that same notional idea of improving the stiffness and strength of the backfill. Here is a slide of what is a, a very famous wall in the literature uh, tracing the behavior of this technology. And this is a, a very high um, wrap face wall that was built in Seattle. And in this uh, variation on the theme, you can see horizontal layers of reinforcement are placed in the soil, they're buried, and then wrapped around the face and then tucked back in to provide the facing. So here the reinforcement provides the, uh, the reinforcing function for the soil proper, but it also maintains the stability and integrity of the facing. Here's a cross section that gives you a sense of of the uh, size of the structure. Uh, and after it was constructed, uh, a surcharge was put on top of it. And in fact, the entire soil mass was part of a preload to pre-compress some soils at the location of a, uh, an over highway overpass that was being constructed in the, uh, Rain at, uh, at the Rainier Avenue location in Seattle. This wall was heavily instrumented. And we learned many things about the mechanical behavior uh, of, this, uh, of this particular wall. Uh, here's another example. This one is a little closer to home in London, Ontario. It was the first prop panel wall constructed in Canada. So the, uh, the concrete panels were constructed off-site, propped on end at the site. And then the fill and the reinforcing layers were placed incrementally from the top to the bottom as the wall was built. And uh, you can see in the slide in the bottom right, there's uh, some instrumentation. And again, this was another wall that we had the opportunity to instrument in order to um, 
assess its long-term performance and also to, to guide the development of models uh, for the design of these systems. Uh, going back to the, the, the West Coast again, uh, here is, is another example of a MSC wall. Here you can see a wall that has been constructed with modular block units. Uh, and here you can see a uniaxial geogrid reinforcement. Uh, here in the top right, you can see a cross section with instrumentation, et cetera. And uh, this was again, another wall in the database of instrumented field scale walls that I I've been able to collect with my partners over many years uh, to develop new design models. We're seeing more and more today, the use of polyester strap reinforcement uh, instead of continuous sheets of geotextile reinforcement or continuous sheets of geogrid reinforcement. So these straps are wound uh, back and forth as you can see here. But again, they perform the same function as I've described before, which is to stiffen and strengthen the backfill soil and support the facing units. Now, these structures are essentially gravity retaining wall systems. The combination of the facing, the soil, and the reinforcement forms a composite mass. And that composite mass must be sufficiently sized to be able to retain the soil behind the reinforced soil mass. And in order to do that, this composite system must remain intact. And therefore, uh, it must not fail due to rupture of the reinforcement layers due to overloading. Uh, the reinforcement must not become disconnected from the facing if we have a hard facing. And the reinforcement must not pull out of the passive zone behind an assumed uh, active failure wedge zone. And being able to design for these limit states and being able to um, quantify margins of safety against these internal failure mechanisms or limit states uh, is, is most challenging and, and has attracted my attention and effort over many years. And I'm gonna focus mainly on this rupture um, limit state and the pullout limit state since they're important and also relatively uh, easy to understand. So today, when we're designing for internal limit states for MSC walls, uh, we design within a load and resistance factor design, LRFD framework, both in Canada and in the United States. So those of you who are designing um, uh, Earth Foundations, uh, you'll be familiar with the Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code. It's the latest version was in 2019. The next version will be in 2024. And uh, in south of the border, uh, the equivalent uh, guidance document or code is the Ashto LRFD Bridge Design. And both of these codes I've, I've been involved in, um, their development and the development of the code sections for mechanically stabilized earth uh, wall systems. And in the LRFD format, um, we see equations like this in which the factored resist nominal resistance has to be greater than the factored nominal load. So here you see the nominal uh, resistance, here's the nominal load. And we apply a resistance factor, which is uh, one or less to the resistance side. And we apply a load factor to the uh, nominal load, which is greater, uh, equal or greater to one. And we must design to satisfy this uh, inequality. And if we now take a, a deeper look at internal stability limit states for these systems, uh, you can see uh, on the load side, there's 
some sort of equation or model to calculate what is the maximum tensile load in a reinforcing element under operational conditions. And there are a number of simple analytical equations that are available to calculate this value, depending on whether it's a, a steel reinforced soil wall or whether it's a polymeric reinforced soil wall. And on the other side are nominal resistances. And these describe the, the capacity uh, of the, the elements to uh, resist load, to resist pullout, and in some cases, depending on the modeling approach to prevent actual failure of the, of the soil. The, the question that this lecture poses is, when we design these structures and we build them, you know, what are the true margins of safety for these limit states? You know, when we use an LRFD framework, if you satisfy uh, the, this inequality, what it does is it tells you that you're safe, but it really doesn't tell you how safe. What we're interested in is what are the true margins of safety? And the true margins of safety are, are going to be a function of uncertainty at the time of the design. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, what are the sources of uncertainty at the time of design? For example, uh, there is uncertainty or variability in the, in the calculation or the value of the nominal load and the nominal resistance. So for example, when I calculate the maximum tensile load in a reinforcing element at time of design, uh, it will be a function of the, often it'll be a function of the friction angle of the soil, the unit weight of the soil. And, and there's some uncertainty in, in those values on it on a project basis. In addition, there may be uncertainty regarding um, the applicability of this load model to the, to the, to the wall that you're actually designing. Uh, on the resistance side, we have the same sort of arguments. I mean, on a project basis, you know, we have to make choices about the input parameters for friction angle and unit weight, and we have to, we may have different levels of confidence in whether the model that we're using for our particular project um, is well suited to the, to the project. And one way of quantifying this uncertainty is to imagine that every estimate of a nominal load or a resist nominal resistance has some spread, some uncertainty. And we can describe that by a coefficient of variation. And in Canadian LRFD practice, uh, we describe this uncertainty as related to level of project understanding. So as we have more confidence in the uh, choice of parameters and foundation conditions and the like, then our level of project understanding goes up and the spread uh, in the estimate of our nominal values becomes less. So high level of project understanding, we might have a COV on a nominal load or resistance of 10%, less certainty, less project information. It could be, as the COV could be as high as 30%. And this concept will be shown uh, quantitatively as I move through my presentation. Other sources of uh, uncertainty uh, are the accuracy of load and resistance models independent of the project itself. And so for example, if we have a load model for the maximum load and reinforcement uh, layer, what is the accuracy of this load model predicted value? Similarly, on the resistance side, we can ask ourselves, uh, this model in isolation, for example, the tensile strength of the reinforcement, you know, what is the accuracy of that model? Or what is the accuracy of the, the model that we use here for the pullout capacity of this reinforcement? This is the capacity that prevents the reinforcement from being pulled out of this passive zone. We can quantify that accuracy as model error quantified by 
bias. And bias is the ratio of a measured or observed value divided by the predicted or calculated value. And, the, and most often in geotechnical engineering, the bias value is not one because we seldom have per perfect uh, geotechnical soil structure interaction models. So, so how do we get this information? Well, if we look at uh, uh, the uh, photograph on the left-hand side, we collected uh, measurements of strain that were then converted to load from 24 different steel strip and MSC walls uh, in the literature. And that, that gave us 97 measurements. So for each one of these measurements, we then went to different design methods and we predicted what the design method would tell us that maximum load should be. Now there are many different load models. And once we have the predicted value and we have the measured value, then we can calculate what's called the bias. And from these 97 data points, we can calculate what the mean bias is. In this particular case, it was 1.19, which means that on average, the measured loads in these walls was about 20% higher than this particular model predicted. And the spread in the bias values was about 40%. COV of 0.4. And you can take these data points, rank order them, and plot them on a CDF plot where we have the standard normal variable versus the load bias on a log scale. And the data plots reasonably as a straight line. And this is a visual cue that these load bias values are log normally distributed. And fortunately, for almost all of the data that I'm going to show you today, this has proven to be the case. And this allows us to uh, take advantage of the benefits of a log normal distribution when it comes to making estimates of probabilities of failure. Now, that was the load side. Now, let's look at the resistance side. So I showed you earlier uh, that one mode of failure is reinforcement can pull out of the soil. So what we want to do then is to quantify the accuracy of resistance models, including the pullout resistance model. And essentially we can do the same thing that we did for the load side. We collected the results of pullout tests where reinforcement was placed in soil buried in the soil, subjected to vertical pressure to simulate the conditions under which the reinforcement would be exposed in the real world. And for each one of these tests, we uh, pulled on this reinforcement until it came out of the soil, and that became a measured uh, pullout capacity. Then we went to the codes and we asked ourselves, well, what would be the predicted value of that pullout capacity? according to um, a, a prescribed equation. And then again, we can take the ratio of the measured pullout capacity divided by the predicted pullout capacity, and we have a resistance bias. And again, seldom is this bias value equal to one. What will happen is that you'll get a spread in these values based on all this data. And if we plot a CDF figure, uh, as before, you can see that this data presents again as a straight line if we plot with a, a log bias scale. And we can extract from this data a mean bias and a spread. And in this particular case, you can see that the mean bias is almost two and a half. That means that the measured pullout capacities are about two and a half times what these models actually predict. And there's a, there's a significant spread in the results. And this is because uh, historically these pullout models have been very conservative in order to encourage safe design. Now, 
other uh, features of the of the accuracy of these um, models are possible correlations between bias and nominal values. So for example, with this load model that you see up here on the left-hand side, you can see that as the calculated load, the predicted load using this particular load model, you can see that the accuracy of the model actually decreases as the load increases. And this is really an undesirable feature of, of any model, whether you're working in a probabilistic framework or in a, in a deterministic or classical factor of safety framework. Here is at the bottom left is another example of where the accuracy of the pullout model changes dramatically as the calculated resistance goes up. So you can argue that these two models are not very desirable. We can accommodate them, but they're not as desirable as the two models that you see on the right-hand side, because these models have much lower bias dependency. And that means that uh, uh, that's equivalent to saying that the slope of this linear trend line is lower. And in fact, the R squared of this uh, linear relationship uh, or the square root of the R squared, which is R, is the correlation coefficient that we're going to see later and is used directly in the calculation, calculations of margins of safety. Uh, another complication is that there can be correlations between the nominal load and the pullout. So for example, the, the nominal load and the and the the, the nominal resistance equation may have common uh, ingredients. For example, they both may have uh, terms that include the friction angle of the soil or the unit weight of the soil. So what can happen is that as the nominal load goes up, the resistance goes up. And so these uh, two nominal values are correlated. And this adds another complication to the assessments of margins of safety in a probabilistic way, uh, but we can handle it. So in order to proceed further, we need to um, introduce a performance function. This performance function, we'll call it G, and it's equal to factor of safety. This is the true factor of safety. Um, minus one. So if this factor of safety was one, G is equal to zero. And we can imagine this true factor of safety as being the ratio of a true resistance value divided by a true uh, load value. And then again, we, we, we subtract one. And now we introduce these bias values which allow us to transform a nominal resistance, for example, that we calculate using our favorite resist analytical resistance model. And by multiplying it by the resistance bias, we return the, uh, the, the actual resistance term. And the same argument applies here. We have a nominal load computed using uh, our favorite analytical model for Tmax, but we know that it has some error and we're interested in the true measurement, so we have to multiply that nominal load by a load res, uh, bias value. So this is the performance function that we used to, um, uh, to quantify margins of safety for each of our limit states, remembering that bias is the ratio of a measured or observed value to a predicted value. And if I assume in this performance function, that each one of these terms uh, are random variables described by a mean and a COV and they're log normal distributed, then I can calculate the probability that this um, performance function or limit state will fail, i.e. g is less than zero, simply using Monte Carlo. And the distribution of G, which is itself 
a log normally distributed um, result will give us this distribution, which is log normal. And the probability of failure is just this red colored zone that you see in here. So if I can move the mean uh, of this uh, distribution to, to the right, I can minimize the uh, probability of failure. Um, and up in here, you can see already the occurrence of a, a beta factor, which is called reliability index, which is just the number of standard deviations between the mean of this distribution uh, and zero. Now, Monte Carlo is, uh, you know, to some people, it's pretty tedious. Uh, but in fact, we can use a closed form solution that was developed uh, by my um, famous uh, past PhD student who we know very well. And uh, uh, together we developed a closed form solution that allows us to calculate beta, the reliability index, rather than the probability of failure, but recognizing that there's a simple mathematical relationship between probability of failure and uh, reliability index, which is shown by this equation that you see here. And this uh, equation <laughs> is shown in this slide here. And at first it looks very frightening, but on closer inspection, it's very informative uh, and uh, allows us to uh, understand all of these competing issues that we talked about that affect our estimates of uh, margins of safety. This equation uh, delivers the reliability index. And what you see in this equation are terms that have been color coded to match the um, sources of uncertainty that I introduced previously. So for example, the green color codes Rep uh, uh, code represents terms that are focused on the variability in the estimate of nominal load and resistance terms. The, the yellow shaded terms are related to uncertainty in the accuracy of load and resistance models that are independent of the project itself. And then there are correlations between model accuracy and predicted nominal values that I showed you before. And these are uh, captured by the correlation coefficients that you see here, rho r and, and uh, uh, rho q. And in order to be able to use this equation, uh, all of these distributions have to be log normal distributed. But I've shown you from measurements that we've taken that this is, this is, the, is the case, or it's accurate enough uh, for practical purposes. So let's just talk a little bit about reliability index beta. Uh, it's a measure of margin of safety in probabilistic terms. And it's a term that's uh, very familiar to structural engineers and uh, was developed um, for structural engineering codes uh, dating back decades. As beta becomes larger, the margin of safety becomes greater. So big beta, better. Small beta, not, not so good. And it can be equated to probability of failure uh, that a limit state is not satisfied. And I think for a lot of geotechnical engineers, probability of failure is probably uh, um, a more common uh, expression of margins of safety, but they're, they're, they're equated to each other. So for example, if you plot probability of failure against reliability index, as I have done in this plot here, you can see that as the probability of failure becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, um, um, you know, numerically here, the reliability index is going up and up further. So for example, if you were designing a structure for a probability of failure of one in a thousand, then the corresponding reliability index value is 3.09. Now, interestingly, for the limit states that 
I'm discussing here for MSC walls, that is the internal limit states for MSC walls, we actually design for a probability of failure of one in 100. That means that one out of 100 of these reinforcing elements will not satisfy the design limit state. Now, that may appear shocking uh, at first blush, but what you have to remember is that we always have multiple layers of reinforcement. So the system is highly strength redundant. So if one layer misbehaves, uh, its neighbors can compensate. So that's the, the qualitative ex explanation of why we're using what appear to be very high probabilities of failure. The uh, returning to this equation, you can see that the nominal factor of safety, which is the ratio of the nominal resistance to the nominal load, actually appears quantitatively in this equation. And in fact, you can uh, rearrange this equation and collect these statistical terms into two larger terms, A and B. And if you do that, what you find is that beta increases uh, linearly with the log of the nominal factor of safety. And this provides a quantitative link between classical factor of safety and margins of safety in probabilistic terms. Now, when, when I was growing up in, in school, we, we, we designed everything according to classical factor of safety concepts. And there has been uh, difficulty uh, sometimes for people to be able to jump from deterministic classical factor of safety design approach to probabilistic uh, approaches because they, they couldn't link the two. One of the benefits of this equation and, and, and the work that Sina did during his PhD was to provide uh, a, a quantitative expression that provides this link. Now, returning again to uh, uh, this equation and its contents, uh, here again, you can see the, uh, we can accommodate the, the, the occurrence of uh, you know, highly correlated or dependencies between bias and nominal loads, okay, by calculating what this correlation coefficient is. So on the, for pullout, uh, the, the brown term is the resistance uh, correlation coefficient. And the, uh, the green here is for the load side. Okay, so again, we can accommodate uh, different levels of this, of this uh, dependency when there are correlations between bias and nominal values. We had spoken earlier about the, the case where we have correlations between the, the nominal loads and the nominal resistance, because these equations have common terms. Uh, so they, they can, depending on the models and the, um, the coefficients of variation that we assign to different terms, we can have positive uh, correlations between these load and resistance sides or even negative uh, relationships. And these, this nominal correlation term, rho n that you see here, uh, appears naturally uh, in this uh, formulation. So now what I'd like to do is to, to demonstrate how we can use uh, this approach to estimate uh, margins of safety in probabilistic terms for walls that have been designed and built. And the first example that I have here was a project uh, in Washington state where a pair of walls were used, uh, reinforced walls were used to support an approach embankment to a bridge. So there was a tall wall on one side and there was a shorter wall on the other side, but these are MSC walls, the brown portion represents the reinforced soil zone. Um, this photograph shows uh, the tall wall 
uh, I couldn't immediately find a photograph of the smaller one, but it, but it has the same sense and flavor of the photograph that you see here. So here's the, the short wall. And the, the, the question that we were asking ourselves was, what is the uh, margin of safety against uh, tensile strength failure? So the rupture or overstressing of the reinforcement along a hypothetical failure plane behind this wall under operational conditions. And the interesting thing is, is that these margins of safety will be uh, a function of what load model. So when we designed this wall, we designed it using a new method called the simplified stiffness method. And when we designed the wall for the simplified stiffness method, we were able to back calculate the reliability index. And because it's related to probability of failure, I can use both axes. I can use probability of failure PF on the bottom and reliability index at the top. And remember that a target reliability index value for, for these internal limit states uh, is 2.33, which is a probability of failure of one in 100. And you can see these plots here and what they are, they are um, uh, calculated beta values in, in these different reinforcement layers. And you can also see that as our um, level of understanding uh, increases, uh, these curves move away from this critical value of 2.33. In no cases were, was any layer uh, below this critical target value of 2.33. So this gave us confidence that if we're designing with the simplified stiffness method, the design is safe in all layers against this mode of failure. However, if we, if we use this, an old model, which is called the Ashtell simplified method, which is extremely conservative. Uh, it would predict that all of these, almost all of these layers would um, not satisfy uh, a satisfactory probabilistic uh, level of safety. Um, the wall has been in service now for almost 10 years and uh, there's been no evidence of any um, misbehavior, which leads us to believe that the simplified stiffness method is, is much more accurate. Uh, here is another example. This is an example of a pet strap wall that was constructed in San Paulo. Actually, there were a pair of them. And uh, to refresh your memory, the reinforcing elements that you see here uh, are these polymer strap type. And here you can see the, the different layers. And this is only one of several walls that we uh, analyzed uh, for margins of safety, uh, walls from many different countries around the world. And what you see here in the plot itself is the reliability index plotted against nominal factor safety. Remember that the nominal factor of safety is the ratio of the nominal resistance using your favorite um, equation for rupture strength and QN is the nominal estimate of the, uh, of the load in the reinforcement under operational conditions. And that's what you see on the, on the bottom axis here. So here the nominal factor of safety is increasing. On the reliability index side, you can see that each of, each of the layers for, for uh, a computed nominal factor of safety gives us a reliability index of one value or another. And you can see as promised that beta changes linearly with nominal factor of safety. So as I um, become more and more conservative in my design, in other words, if, as I use a stronger and stronger reinforcement, the nominal factor safety goes up and the reliability index goes up, which gives me an estimate of what the margin of safety is in probabilistic terms. Now, in this particular example, um, you can see that the, uh, 
we all of these data points are uh, above 2.33. So there was no danger that this limit state, the rupture limit state had not been satisfied. But if we go to the same wall and we look at the pullout limit state, a different picture emerges. Again, uh, on the horizontal axis, we have the nominal factor of safety against pullout. This is the calculation that you would do if you were in a performing a deterministic design. And you can see that for some layers, and these were layers that were close to the top of the wall, we, we were close to, but below the target reliability index value of 2.3, or equivalently a target probability of failure of one in 100. And if we replot the data as uh, um, showing the distribution of these beta values uh, with the depth of the reinforcement below the top of the wall, you can see where we're nudging uh, this one in a hundred probability of failure. So this wall from a, a reliability point of view for the pullout limit state uh, was um, not satisfactory for reinforcement layers very close to the top of the wall. And what we found in general is that uh, usually when pullout is a problem, when it controls design, it is indeed the layers that are closest to the top of the wall, particularly for strip type reinforcement, be they polymeric type or be they steel type. And this type of calculation tells us exactly how much. So the question then is, well, what, what can we do about it? Well, remembering that the nominal factor of safety is just the nominal resistance divided by the nominal load. And then I inspect the content of the equation that gives me the nominal value for resistance. You can see that if I increase the length of the reinforcement, Rn will increase, the nominal factor of safety will increase, and I will therefore move you know, these layers up this slope. And I can adjust the length of the reinforcement so that this nominal factor of safety gives me a data point, which is above this critical line. Okay, so all I have to do is increase these two layers a little bit to have an adequate nominal factor of safety that translates to a satisfactory reliability index value. So in conclusion from this presentation, but also from the body of work that has led to this presentation, what we have uh, done and learned is uh, we have collected load and resistant measurements from instrumented uh, walls and, and laboratory element tests for pullout and the like. And from this data, we've been able to calculate the bias statistics for steel and polymeric walls. And the reliability, using this data, we can estimate the reliability index uh, for design and analysis of MSC walls. And we can do this using a closed form solution, which is easily implemented in a spreadsheet. And this means we don't have to do Monte Carlo simulation, subject to the caveats that I introduced earlier about these distributions being log normal, et cetera. And you can, you can find differences. The beta values are detectable between walls, uh, between walls um, and, and, and depending on, on what load models and resistance models you're using to estimate the um, margins of safety against different modes of failure. And reliability-based analysis and design is, is informative uh, of the true probabilistic limit states margins of safety at time of design, rather than someone just saying, um, you know, it satisfies LRFD requirements or it, you know, it has a, it has a large factor of safety. Large factor of safety tells you nothing about the margin of safety in probabilistic terms. And we can link both the reliability index uh, to probability of failure and to nominal factor of safety 
where nominal factor of safety is always the starting point for any uh, MSC wall limit state design. Uh, here are a few uh, references uh, that um, that have led to this uh, presentation for the for the interested uh, audience member, and uh, like all other professors, they are supported by former uh, PhD students and uh, postdocs, and also other professors. So I. I would like to acknowledge these people here, in particular Tony Allen in uh, the United States and Yoshi Miyata in, uh, uh, in Japan and uh, Sina, you all know, and I saw Nizam's uh, photograph earlier during the introduction of this session. So all these folks have, have really helped. And that concludes my presentation. Um, thank you for your time and patience, and I, I hope you learned something useful.